It's good to be back with you this evening. I'm having to get used to these floodlights here. It's almost, I feel like the Apostle Paul on the road to Jericho, but I, I, I'm here. Looks like you guys are there. Thanks for coming out on this miserable evening, okay? After a really miserable day. But it's very beautiful still here in Spokane, and we've gotten out around and about town a bit today. And I want you to know that my wife and I got rested up from that brutal trip out here. So anyhow, it's good to be here with you. And again, I want to remind you that we do have some things that are available to you for free. One is a special edition of the Signs of the Times. This is the Seventh-day Adventist Outreach Missionary Journal. And what they did is they took the writings of Ellen White from her great book, The Great Controversy Between Christ and Satan, and I think they must have condensed down a bit what she had to say about Luther, and it's a beautiful introduction to what I call the really evangelical, Bible-believing, justification preaching, Jesus is Lord Luther. So uh, you will enjoy this, I know, and it'll be just an excellent introduction for you if you're not acquainted with Luther the man. Also, I want to remind you that there are books available from the Adventist Book Center associated with the Upper Columbia Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. One is our recently released Here We Stand, edited by my colleagues and friends, Nicholas Saddlemeyer and Michael W. Campbell. This is subtitled Luther, the Reformation, and Seventh-day Adventism. Uh, about three weeks ago, we had a conference in which we celebrated Luther, and I was a part of this. And in here, you will find an essay that I have, along with a number of other essays that were presented at the conference, and there are others still additionally there. And then the ministerial staff of the Upper Columbia Conference and probably others will be familiar with the author of this book, Nicholas P. Miller. I understand that he came to a worker's retreat of our ministry, and this book is entitled The Reformation and the Remnant, The Reformers Speak to Today's Church. As I told you last night, Nick Miller is both a lawyer, he is the Religious Liberty Director of the Lake Union Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, but he's also Associate Professor of Church History at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews University. And he's just one of the most smart, insightful characters who has an amazing ability to write. Now, if you get this book, he's going to hurt your brain a little bit, but that's good. You will get healed from it, and you will be saying, wow, 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 what terrific insights. So anyhow, uh, I'd like to recommend those. Again, I want to remind you that take some time as we are in this season of memorializing the ministry of Luther. And I have recommended that you read at least one good biography of Luther. And I still don't think you can improve upon Roland Bainton's Here I Stand. It's one of those great classics that was written probably more than 50 years ago. It was written, I think, back in the late 40s, the early 50s, and the famous film on Martin Luther, I think it was called Here I Stand, was inspired by that book. Also, a more up-to-date one, and there are many others, and probably some even better scholarly, but this is one that I've been really blessed by, by James N. Kittleson, Luther the Reformer, subtitled The Story of the Man and His Career. So anyhow, those are just a couple of three recommendations. Again, these two books by Miller and the one edited by 
Campbell and Saddlemeyer are available through the Adventist Book Center here if you would like to secure copies of those. Now, I'm just going to take these and set them down right here. And I want to begin tonight by talking to you about something that was shared with you last night from our introductory pastor. This is one of our Hispanic pastors here in the area. And he told about what the Reformation has meant to him. And one of the key things that he said is, I am so thankful for Luther's emphasis upon the Bible and the Bible alone. This was very precious to him this emphasis as it helped to really inspire him to get into God's inspired word. But I want to tell you, my experience was a little bit different. Now, I grew up in a Seventh-day Adventist, very Christian home. My father was a leader in our local congregation. We always went to camp meeting. I grew up loving the Lord. My mother didn't tell me this until the day when I was ordained to gospel ministry that in her womb, while I was in her womb, she had special unction from the Holy Spirit that I was to be set aside and dedicated for gospel ministry. Now, thankfully, Mama kept her mouth shut. But her actions, as I look back on it, were amazing. And she didn't tell me about this until I was in the congratulation lines at Southern Adventist University where the Georgia Cumberland Conference of Seventh-day Adventists holds their camp meeting, their annual camp meeting convocation. I had just been ordained and in the congratulatory line, I was there greeting a bunch of people and all of a sudden I felt some jerking on my shirt tails and it was my mama. And she said, Woody, I just can't wait to talk to you anymore. I want you to know that this day is an answer to my prayers of the burden that was given to me by God about you when you were in my womb. Isn't that amazing? But as a teenager, I went through a period of very serious doubt that was sparked by my world history teacher at Titusville High School, where I spent my first two years in secondary school. His name was Billy C. Hancock. He was a very likable Georgia cracker doubter. <laughs> he was a military veteran and he was a skinny little guy, but he really loved world history, but he did not love God. Now he wasn't an unholy character, uh, he was a, a, a really more than decent man. He was a married man. He had children. But he was an open agnostic, and he really shook me up. And he really forced me to really go down to the foundations. And one of the things that he did is he made fun of the Bible. And he says, oh, it is... Probably got a lot of good history in it, but I just have a hard time believing that there is a God in a world that is so filled with terrible things that happen. How could a God who claims to be the creator, who claims to be a God of love, how could that God allow so much evil to transpire? Now, I knew the Lord was leading in my life, and I felt the Lord leading, but that always was a problem for me. And so I began searching for the best arguments that I could get for the existence of God. And of course, I became acquainted with the great classic philosophical arguments that were particularly worked up by many of what we call Christianity's scholastic theologians. And of course, let me just talk to you about some of these arguments. And by the way, my brother Ivan 
is a private scholar who has written a massive tome, which he will probably never be able to get published because it's such a massive, huge tome. And he is looking for all of the evidences for God that are available to us in the natural world. Now, these arguments have been classically called by, there are different arguments, but these are called the classical scholastic arguments. For instance, there is the argument from design. This is the cosmo, uh, uh, the teleological argument. That means when you look at this and that and the other, it points to the talos, to the end, that there must be a divine being who could come up with such an intricately designed creation. In other words, all this design points to a designer. It just couldn't have happened. And then there's the cosmological argument. And the cosmological argument says everything seems to happen ultimately by cause and effect. So therefore, there must be some kind of first cause. Okay? and so on and so forth. And there are others that we could mention. And whenever I teach the course called Doctrine of God, I take my students through these. One of them is also the moral argument of God. What it says is, it seems that there is an innate moral sense that infects just about everything. That infects just about Tighten me up, thank you. All right. Boy, I need tightening, particularly I'm such a loose cannon. <laughs> and it seems that there is a universal moral sense, and so there must be, have to have been, some supernatural moral arbiter that would give us something like the Ten Commandments or something like the widespread moral sense. In other words, everybody except the most depraved just knows that murder is wrong, just knows that rape is wrong. And if you've ever been burgled, as the British say, if you've ever been burglarized, you have an innate sense of the violation that has been perpetrated upon you. And so I remember wrestling with all of these, but while I went on with my faith, it really wasn't until I began to really wrestle with the larger truths of Scripture that I began to see why it was that Luther made such a big production out of Sola Scriptura. And basically, the argument runs like this. The truths of the Bible are so inherently convincing in pointing us to a God who is not just a creator, not just a moral mentor, but a God who is profoundly loving, a Trinitarian God who is deeply interpersonal just by his eternal existence as Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And what seems to bind them together, according to Scripture, is infinite love divine. And that love divine has been manifested through his grace. And this grace is not only manifested in creating us in God's image and creating the world and the universe in which we can play out our existence as sons and daughters of God, but this God of grace has sent to us Jesus Christ to witness to what real love, redeeming, and governing love is, but that this Jesus Christ also offered up his life 
as an act of atonement for sinners. And that the Holy Spirit has it his greatest delight in uplifting before us the person and the work of Jesus Christ who has revealed to us the love of the Father and has made life so wonderfully meaningful. Now, this leads us to the key point that we want to talk about tonight, and that is how Scripture alone and grace alone are key concepts that point to the experience of faith alone. You see, there's an interesting and intricate dynamic in all of the solas of the Protestant Reformation, which Luther was so powerfully instrumental in igniting. And so it was only when I became aware of the great truths inherent in the biblical revelation of the Trinity that I really began to come to the powerful conclusion that the greatest evidence for the existence of God is seen in the face and the pierced hands, the pierced side, the pierced feet of our infinite, divine human Savior. So let me pick it up kind of where we left off last night. While faith alone was the great theme of Luther's reforming efforts, faith alone never stood apart from God's inspired scriptures and his saving grace that is revealed quintessentially in those scriptures. Now this saving grace is manifest in terms of being declared righteous that's the great doctrine of justification by grace through faith alone, that God is willing to take us and forgive us of our sins and give us new legal standing before God and before the universe and before one another as sinless for Christ's sake. You see, this is what happens when we become converted we have sensed the great calling power of God and the convicting power of God, but it ultimately brings us to the place where we are converted and we are justified. But God doesn't leave it there. This grace not only manifests itself in forgiveness, but it also manifests itself in gradually helping us to become more and more like God in our attitudes, actions, in other words, in our character as Christians who are growing in grace. So hopefully it would be said of us, look at that person, look how much they love Jesus and they love other people and how kind they are to people that are unkindly to them. This all is the result of not just justifying grace, but also sanctifying grace. Let me put it this way. Grace includes not only the power of God to convert, to forgive, and to transform, all wrought by the power of the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now, my question to you tonight is, what is the relationship between the Bible and God's special revelation and God's saving grace? Maybe the more basic question could go this way. What is it that makes the Bible authoritative for Christians and the way they think theologically, work for the glory of God, worship God, and witness for God, and act morally or ethically. 
Do you understand what I'm driving at here? If somebody asks you, why do you believe the Bible is God's inspired word, I would hope that your answer would go something like this. The Bible is the only place that I have ever found that so clearly reveals the person of Jesus Christ and alerts us to the mighty workings of the Holy Spirit also that we can not only get to know God but to be reconciled to him sinfully unworthy though we are. Now my question to you is how does this relate to the canon of scripture and its authority? Is, is everybody with me on this issue? Do you, do, you, do you understand what I'm driving at here? My basic answer is this, is that it is the manifestation of the grace of God and our experience of that grace that primarily lends formal authority to the canonical scriptures. There's just not another God like the Trinitarian God. There's just not another divine being like the God-man, Jesus Christ. And the only place that you're really going to find out about the gracious Jesus is in the canonical scriptures. The Old Testament preparing the way with the great stories of creation, the great stories of the fall, the great stories of how God dealt with the patriarchs and the prophets and the people of Israel and the Judah, the people of Judah and all of those great stories, all of which have a developing theme that is saying there's something better yet to come than Moses and the prophets because Moses and the prophets had their eye on a distant picture that would lead to the manifestation of the Messiah who would go to a place called Calvary that we might be forgiven our sins might find new life and meaning in abundant Christian service and witness and on and on it goes now let me state it for you more technically you see I'm a university prof and I sometimes have to descend to really theological finery the key terms that are used for this dynamic is for Christians, the Bible has formal authority, okay? Formal authority. But for Christians, the Bible not only has formal authority, it has self-evident authority because of what we have discovered in the face and the person of Jesus Christ through the witness of the biblical writers. Let me read it to you from my manuscript. Let, let me review this for you now. This is really an important point. What is the relationship between the Bible, God's special revelation and God's saving grace. The more basic question is this, what is it that makes the Bible authoritative for Christians and the way they think theologically, work for God's glory, worship God, witness and act morally? And the basic answer for Protestant Christians is that the Bible has self-evident authority because of its unique revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, you know, I'm a little bit embarrassed as I stand before you because I've lost a sheet of paper here, but I will probably be able to go on without that sheet of paper. At least I hope I can. Nope, here it is. Let me read this for you again. Now, listen to me carefully. Let's put your thinking caps on. The basic answer for Protestant Christians is that the Bible has self-evident authority because it is the unique 
special revelation that points us to Christ and his redeeming grace. In other words, the Bible has inherent authority because of what it tells us about God and our sinful selves and how we can be redeemed by faith in Christ through the reception of his Holy Spirit imparted redeeming grace. Now, this again, and I've already, you know, opened this up a little bit. This brings us to the vital theme that differentiates what theologians call the Bible's formal authority that arises out of what we call its material authority. Now, by material authority, what we mean by that is the greatest evidence for the inspiration of the Scripture that brings it formal authority is the very great good news about how loving and lovable and redemptive God is. And this, the philosophers of religion, including Christian philosophers, cannot fully get at with just the classic philosophical arguments for the existence of God. I philosophically dreamed of a girl that I would marry one day, and I came up with a philosophical ideal, and that was my formal vision. But when I met Peggy, I was slain that she was more than just a philosophical ideal. She became a loving, attractive reality in my life. And this is what springs forth from the pages of Scripture from beginning to end, God's marvelous redeeming grace. And this is what really gives the Bible its material authority. Do you follow me? Okay. And so you see, we get all of this, not just with our heads, but we get it with our hearts. And you know, really, I do not want to put down head knowledge because I am a heavy-headed intellectual. But if I cannot break it down to the point to where when it comes to the ultimate factors of human existence and divine human relationship, if I can't get that really broken down to where it will move your heart and change your life, all the scholasticism isn't worth the paper it's written on. Now, it's important, it's helpful, it's suggestive, it points, and so on. But again, to state it as clearly as I can state it, the reason why the Bible has taken on formal authority is because of its inherent material authority to incite us to receive the love of God in every possible way we can take it as fast as we can get it into our lives so that we can live for the glory of God. Now, let me kind of work this over in a bit of a summation. Maybe it could more more simply be put this way. The central theme of the Bible has consistently centered on Jesus Christ and how he died and how he was resurrected so that he could make provision for the salvation of sinners, the lost. And that includes every last person in this room sitting or standing or sleeping or falling asleep or scratching their head wondering, Dr. Whidden, what in heaven's name are you talking about? I think maybe the old gospel song puts it this way. The theme of the Bible is Jesus and how he died to save men. Okay? How how does the rest of that line go? The plan of salvation unfolds it for the glory of God and the blessing of man, something like that. Okay? The theme of the Bible is Jesus 
and how he died to save men. And all of this that we find in biblical revelation, the great truth that the Protestant principle of sola scriptura points to, All of this revelation about God's grace and how it is communicated is what gives the Bible its power and inherently formal authority for Christians. This is why we keep banging our heads on it. This is why we keep opening up our hearts to it. This is why we keep hungering for our preachers and our teachers to make Jesus more intelligible to us in a practical way, not just a theological way. But all good theology leads to profound, practical spirituality and quality of life that is incomparable. Thus, to put it again a little bit more technically, thus, Sola gratia, that is, grace alone, and sola fide contain the great theme of the Bible, and thus they invest the written word with formal shaping authority in a way that we can live and think as Christians. Practically speaking, this works out in the following way. When we stay close to our Bibles in personal and corporate study, worship and proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we find the means to grasp the message and an experience of the message as it generates in a more clear, excuse me, orthodox manner, okay? And all this has power to redeem sinners from sin and enable believers to live for God's glory and the blessing of others. This dynamic of the outflowing of God's grace forms the foundation for what it means to be a Christian and a church member and a servant of God. Are we making ourselves clear here? Why is Luther important to us? Because Luther not only got sola scriptura, but the reason why he really got Sola Scriptura is when he began to read the Scripture, that became, became the more unique place where he was able to comprehend and to come to know Jesus Christ and His graces so that his life would find real meaning. And all of this, of course, then led to his understanding, uh, a greater understanding of these five great Protestant solas. Now, I don't know what else to say to you tonight except when we think about these great solas, and let's remind ourselves of what they are again. Generally, we start with sola scriptura. Then, usually what comes to next is sola gratia, and then comes sola Christe, okay? And then comes what? Sola fide. And then comes Sola Gloria Dei, solely for the glory of God, okay? All of this is to be for the glory of God. But ultimately, from our point of view, all of this is for the incorporation of our unity into Christ Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. Does this make sense? And this is one of the great things that we owe to Luther. Now, again, let's be reminded that Luther's big problem was is 
where can I find a gracious God? Because God to him seemed to be nothing but a consuming fire. And he had listened to a lot of sermons on hellfire and brimstone. He understood the fear of God, but Luther did not understand the love of God until he began to really confront Scripture and Scripture alone, which then led him to a deeper understanding of Christ and Christ alone because he had had a profound experience of the totally undeserved grace of God. Okay? And it was then that Luther would begin to write songs, to preach sermons that were to the glory of God and the blessing of his listeners, his readers, and those that were his students in the university. And this is what really empowered him to become the great heroic, if you please, erupting power of the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century. Now, again, I would remind you that Luther's great struggle was how can I find a gracious God and his greatest discovery for his own self was sola fide. And this brings us to the setting for tomorrow morning's presentation where I will seek to pull together for you how sola gratia, sola fide, sola scripture can bring us to the point to where we can bring glory to God. Okay? Now, before I quit this evening, and I'm going to not go as long as I went last night, I want to remind you about how much fun Martin Luther is. My wife did some research today. This is a human researcher. She did some research today on the internet to come up with some more of Luther's funny sayings, okay? Uh, and one of them goes something like this. Speaking about husbands and wives, he says to wives, you ought to make your husband sorry to have to leave home in the morning before he goes to work. And she said, Luther then says to men, you ought to live in such a way that your wife will be happy to have you come home. <laughs> she would be sorry to see you leave but also make her so that she will be glad to welcome you home. Isn't that neat? Now, this is what I call really proper rubber-hits-the-road Christianity. <laughs> Again, my wife was inspired, and uh, she wanted to remind me to tell you that one of the endearing things about Luther was Luther as a father. Again, as I mentioned to you last night, this was one of the great surprises in Luther's life. He was not sexually obsessed. That was not the reason why he wanted to get married, even though he was a red-blooded German man. And he probably had not had much loving nurture from his mother. Although Luther's parents cared deeply about him, and saw that he had a good education, but they were not role model parents when it comes to restraining severity when it comes to discipline. And so Luther had a rather love-hate relationship with his parents. But when he got married, of course, he really was in love romantically with Catherine von Bora, his wife, Katie. And he came to call her Lord Katie. <laughs> and as I told you last night, she really was a strict disciplinarian, particularly when it came to financial management 
and the management of their goods. If Luther got a gold coin, she made him swear not to do a thing with it until she had turned it over for her management, not his mismanagement. He was terribly improvident and was, if you please, generous to a fault. And he loved to call her Lord Lady of the Pig Market. Because she knew what to do at the pig market when she went shopping for slaughter animals and and, and so on. But but anyhow, she presented him with his first child and his response was, good heavens, Lord, save us as parents. The Lord has presented us with another little pagan in desperate need of conversion. Do you look upon your children that way? (laughs) In your realistic moments, as you come to know them, you have your humanity tested probably more than anything else when it comes to parenting. In fact, I have a rule of thumb. You just can't go to heaven unless you have become a Seventh-day Adventist pastor because that teaches you to be patient with the saints. You just can't go to heaven unless you've gotten married, okay? Because your wife or your spouse, if you're a wife, will test you like no other person because such intimacy brings out not only the best in us, but it can bring out the worst because you and I know that marriage success always comes with mutual submission as we self-sacrificially seek each other's happiness. Okay. Now, what's the third one, Peggy? What's what's the third one that I was talking about? Yeah, yeah, it was those two that we we really wanted to talk about, all right? Oh, yeah, yeah, this was a beautiful one that Peggy found today. Luther, as he laid a favorite pet dog in its grave, prayed a prayer in which he says, I look forward to seeing this dog in heaven, and I know this little dog will have a golden tail. How is that one? (laughs) Luther and his golden tail dog. But let me close tonight with again a little summation on where we've been and where we're going. The real material principle of Scripture, in other words, all that the Scripture contains regarding the redemptive knowledge of God, particularly as it's been revealed in the face of Jesus Christ, certainly has pointed us to our God who is a God of grace who proffers to us all that is needed so that we can be reconciled to God and become servants and sons and daughters of the Lord Jesus Christ. The greatest argument for the inspiration of Scripture is seen in the face of the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has revealed to us what the Father is like And it is in knowing this that we come to appreciate the ongoing inspirations, comforts, and directions of the ever always working Holy Spirit of the Holy Trinity. Now, all of this is a manifestation of sola gratia, grace alone, grace alone. And this will then bring us to a more serious consideration of how justifying grace will interrelate with sanctifying grace. Now, Luther was not the best at this integration, but he certainly really helped us to understand and see that God's grace as revealed in Scripture, brought home to us by the Holy Spirit, does point us to the fact that in Christ we can be free of the burden of guilt 
and the burden of the power of sin in our lives. And this is what we will talk more about tomorrow morning and tomorrow afternoon. I thank you for your very pleasant attention this evening and may we close with just a quick word of prayer. Lord, bless us and guide us as we go forth. Give us all a renewed appreciation for the great solace of the Protestant Reformation that we're so ably pointed to by the great fountainhead of the Protestant Reformers, one Martin Luther. We thank you for not only the witness of his writings, but the witness of his life when he was at his best, he certainly did embody so many of the virtues of the fruit of the Spirit that would be the privilege and is the privilege of all of us who make Jesus Lord and Savior. So guide us and strengthen us as we continue our setting together. In the name of Jesus, we pray this. Amen. Thank you so much, Dr. Witten. What a blessing uh, your presentation was tonight. And we look forward to tomorrow. Just a few things about tomorrow. We have three different um, uh, times that we're meeting tomorrow morning, which is usually uh, the period of our worship services. And then we have tomorrow afternoon and then tomorrow evening. So we want to encourage you to come out and bring a friend. I think we're going to have quite a few more tomorrow from the Spokane area in attendance, so we look forward to that. Uh, also, I wanted to mention too, as you're leaving, if you have uh, your paper that you have that you found as you sat down tonight, if you wanna fill that out and just drop it at the back there with the information booth, that would be terrific. We'd love to hear from you. And, uh, but until tomorrow, uh, may God's grace, sola gratia, may it extend to you throughout these evening hours until we see you tomorrow. God bless you. <laughs>